It's September 7, 2011, and Kevin DeYoung is here with me in Minneapolis, and we're going to talk, God willing, about sanctification here. And uh, one of the incentives for doing this is that uh, not only is Kevin the pastor of University Reformed Church in Lansing, but he just finished, you just finished a sabbatical. And the main project of the sabbatical, as I understand it, was trying to finish a book mm -hmm. on sanctification. And the title, at least tentatively, is uh, The Whole, H-O-L-E, yes. in, in Our Holiness. That's right. So that's one incentive for doing this. And then lots of blog discussions uh, recently about sanctification, its relationship to faith and uh, justification and gospel preaching. So I'm not sure where this conversation will go. I've just got lots of questions here, and, uh, and we've decided he can go back and forth in, in whatever way is helpful. Yeah. We've both got our Bibles in front of us, so we'll see where this goes. So I think what might get us started best is to say, um, and don't, don't talk for, for half an hour on this question, okay? Uh, what is holiness and what's the whole in it? So, in other words, what, what prompted the book and uh, what's the gist of the book? Yeah. Uh, I'll answer the second question first. I would say the hole in our holiness is that I don't think we are thinking too much about holiness. Uh, first, and I come back to that, but the, the first question, what is holiness? I mean, most simply, uh, people say it's separation. Uh, it's being set apart. God is holy, so we are to be holy because God is holy. So it's God's Godness, His purity, His difference from His creation. So to be holy is most fundamentally to be like God. Uh, and then because Jesus is the perfect image of God, it is Christ likeness. You could also describe it as keeping the commandments because Christ kept the commandments perfectly. So, simply answer would be holiness is godliness, and uh, the whole in our holiness. Um, you know, the, the subtitle, at least that we're working on right now, is filling the gap between gospel passion and the pursuit of godliness. So, if you have a gospel passion, and I don't at all assume that's just a given, we can just sort of yep check that off. Everyone's got that. No, we always need to work on that preach the gospel. This is it by no means saying, you know what, we need a little less gospel, not that, but connecting that gospel passion and not being afraid to say, you know, I, I love the gospel of free grace and I am pursuing holiness by God's help with all of my might. I was really struck by, I think, Richard Lovelace, one of his books said Puritanism was a, a reformed holiness movement. And I, I would love for whatever God is doing with Reformed Christians in our day, that you could say the same thing. So, uh, when you say godliness, um, you have in mind practical kinds of attitudes and behaviors, like? Like, I think if you look at the vice lists and the virtue lists in the New Testament, I think you get a pretty clear idea of what godliness, what holiness is. So, you go to the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, I mean, a holy person, as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You could go to the opposite of that, and an unholy person is marked by sexual morality and dissension and idolatry and adultery. There, you could compile a long list of these sort of character mm -hmm. traits mm -hmm. for the holy person or not. Uh, I think what, what sort of gets in our minds sometimes and trips us up is we think we have a list of taboos, uh, yeah. some of which might be helpful, but some of which may be dated and aren't really appropriate. So we hear holiness and some people will immediately recoil from that and think, okay, I have a list about how long my hair can be or how long my you know, beard needs to be or something where holiness is much more of a, a character trait in the sort of person that you are in Christ manifesting his character. So, so the gap, you said the, filling the gap between yeah. the gospel passion and Pursuit of godliness, so yeah. you said. Mm -hmm. So your your sense is that with the resurgence of gospel passion these days, which we both say is glorious, right. um, has come a fear of or indifference to or a failure to reckon with 
this, this um, character qualities or traits or um, behaviors or attitudes that should be pursued and it's something's not going right here. Yeah. Yeah, I, and to give a few examples of where I, I see that, one would be, I think there's a sort of spiritual way in which we talk. Uh, Isaiah 64, all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. You actually, this is very helpful to me, write about it in Future Grace, that we shouldn't understand Isaiah is saying every possible good thing you could do, the Lord looks, sneers upon it as a filthy rag. I mean, you, you would never say to your son, who of his own initiative mows the lawn, he's eight years old, and he gets crooked lines, and you just look at it and say, filthy, dirty, I hate that. It means nothing to me. So. I, I think in an effort to, to come to grips with our own sin, we, we almost are too spiritual, if that makes sense, and we, and we talk as if nothing I ever do could possibly be pleasing to God. There is no real difference between uh, me and you know, someone who is godly. You know, it's all just, we sort of level the playing field. There's really no distinction between different kinds of sins, different levels of maturity. It's just all filthy rags. That's all we have. And we sort of revel in that in a way that's not helpful, not, not precise enough. If we yeah. say, God, there's nothing I could do as a justified Christian to make God more or less pleased with me. Yeah. You just have to say, maybe that's right. <laughs> I don't think even a maybe. It get, doesn't get a maybe. Well, well, I mean, unless you're talking <laughs> about just the level of justification. I'm not less justified, but yeah, if you use the word pleased, then you don't get a maybe. Not with, not with all the text I see in the book. I yeah. mean, we should be pleasing, and we can be more or less pleasing right. to our Father, and He can be more Displeased or less upset with us. with us and spank us. Right. So, yeah. So, that you're saying that that uh, disinclination to want to go there is, is one of the, the gaps. Yeah, yeah, here. one of the gaps. I think there's a, there's a fear, and even in preaching, we want gospel-centered preaching. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, we don't want moralistic, therapeutic deism. We don't want sermons that just tell people, here's three steps to be better. But I feel like we, we end up pulling the punch on some texts that maybe need to land on, you ought to feel convicted. There's sin here. There's holiness that you need the Lord to work in you and you need to strive after. But we're afraid to land on the imperative, so we pull the punch at the very end and say, you yeah. know, but it doesn't really matter yeah. because Jesus yeah. died well, for your sins. Yeah, well, this is huge to me. I mean, I, I, I may, may go too far, but I, I have said, I don't preach salvation sermons. Every, every sermon is a salvation sermon. I'm always getting the saints saved, meaning perseverance is a community project, right. and all of the Bible is an instrument in keeping me uh, in, in the faith. Um, so my question, when you say needs, needs to pursue, is holiness, sanctification, change in moral behavior necessary for final salvation? Yes. And that's, do you think that's underplayed? I mean, I agree, totally. What yeah. would you go to a text? I mean, there's a lot. I mean, the, the one that people usually go to is in Hebrews, without holiness, you will not see the face of God. Yeah. And I think it's uh, talking about not just positional holiness, yes, that's true, but a, a progressive holiness. Yeah, that because it says pursue peace. Yes. And the holiness, yes. pursue it. Yeah, you, no, you don't really have it, you right. pursue it. This is something that you need to demonstrate in your life. I mean, so many texts, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, here are character traits. If you are marked by these, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. Yeah. You, you won't. So, I, as Protestants, we're very nervous about that. It's probably good that we get a little nervous, but, but lots, of, lots of Christians have come before us and have balanced these things, maybe that's not the right word, but put them together in the right way. So say, say the, a key to putting together, standing before the judgment seat of Christ, knowing that there is a holiness without which I won't get into heaven and I'm still justified and declared perfect in his sight by faith alone, apart from works of the law. Just give us a sketch on how that, how people should think about that. How does that work? I would say the key word is, is evidence. There needs to be some evidence that this grace that has gone in you, has flown out of you. Uh, 
uh, I'm cribbing from things I've, I've heard you say even before about the book and the books in Revelation. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's unalterable. But there's going to be a book. There's books that are open too. That you, and you might have a small book like The Thief on the Cross, but there needs to be something that demonstrates faith worked itself out in love in, in John Piper and Kevin DeYoung. There was a faith here that worked itself out in love. It's not grounded in that working out of love, but there needs to be evidence of it. Any, any idea in your head why God would set it up this way? And those, why not just say justification by faith alone, and if you, if, you, if you have any holiness, that would be good, and if you don't, it doesn't matter. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> it brings God glory when he transforms sinners, it brings him glory to save them, but also to transform them yes. and, to, and to reckon that what he has reckoned us to be is in the process of becoming that, so that th there is a process that's finalized in glorification. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, I like J.C. Ryle, his book on, on holiness is just a classic, one of my favorites. And I mean, he talks about you're not fit, fitted for heaven without some measure of holiness. Why, why would you want to be in heaven? The people there are, are all holy. Their conversation is all holy. Their thoughts are all holy. So if you have no interest in holiness here, why in the world would you want to be in heaven? It, it, it's not your people. It's not your yeah. style. Yeah. Mm, I'd love to go there. Uh, I gotta, <laughs> Can um, I ask you a question? Um, yeah, no? if you don't get me too far off track. Okay. Um, so future grace, which I found helpful. Here, here's a critique I've heard. And you probably heard it. And I don't agree with it, but I want to hear your response. John Piper in Future Grace uh, doesn't go back enough to the cross. It's not centered mm -hmm. enough on the once for all. Uh, it's not really on the gospel. In the gospel itself, the work of Christ on the cross, that should be sufficient to fuel, anchor, ground all of this pursuit of holiness why don't you do more to go back to the cross? Yeah, yeah. well, it, it could be true. I mean, it could be that proportionately, I should say more. So I, I don't know about proportion, but theologically, um, my defense would be that the way the New Testament functions is that our acceptance and all of God's future blessings are purchased decisively at the cross he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How logically. Will he not also. Yeah. So that 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 rhetorical question there is really a, a therefore. Therefore, he will most certainly give us all things, and all things are every every blessing imaginable in the future that God will. All that God is for me in Jesus, and all the help to get there is bought there. So, theologically, I'm totally dependent on the past, and I am not to overstate it, totally oriented on the future. Meaning, he bought this. I live my next minute. I live my next minute. I need God's help to finish this interview. And my trust that he will give it will have a character shaping effect on how I approach it. I won't be as wrapped up in me and what people are thinking about me because now I've got this total confidence that the blood bought assistance in two minutes from now will be there. I, that's the way I live my life. So that's why the book sounds the way it does. It's, the whole book is tried to defend that what, what the cross bought for me in the assistance of the Holy Spirit and all the guaranteed future blessings are, I, I want to say, the key mm -hmm. to holiness. And I don't know, I haven't read your book yet. I've got it and I've snooped around in it. But I don't know what you're, you're going to say. I love that section where you list 40 motivations. I say, yeah. whoa, this is biblical. I like this. Now, how do they all relate to each other? Kind of each other. So did, did I answer enough on the yeah, future yeah. grace thing? Yeah. The, 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 the gospel is founding my life everywhere. But my orientation is on what it bought for me. It bought God for me. And he shows up, and he will finally show up decisively. And, and the reason why I love that answer, and, and the book goes to, you alluded to one of the chapters, I have 40 reasons, 40 motivations for holiness. And I think it could have put 100 in there, mm -hmm. but ha had 40. And I, I think because Christ, he's a good physician, he gives different medicines for us. He knows what, what this person needs as a medicine, as an elixir to motivate them to holiness, maybe right. different than this person. Right. And so part of my 
concern, and you wouldn't want to say, you never say too much gospel, but if we make it sound like the only thing you could tell a person to motivate them to holiness is Jesus died for your sins. Now, this is going to sound wrong, but it's very biblical. That's not the only motivation. (laughs) I mean, there are all sorts of the example of Christ, future grace, fear of punishment, uh, that you might be won over by your neighbors. And that goes interesting. You know, in my tradition, reading the Heidelberg Catechism, when it asks, what are the motivations for doing good deeds? Uh, I think it gives two of them uh, out of gratitude. That's expected. And then third, that you might win over your neighbors with your, I mean, whoa, are we allowed to say that? Well, yeah, that, that's a biblical from yeah. Matthew 5 and 1 Peter chapter 2. I wonder, two. I mean, I, this just came to my mind, whether that scenario you just painted where the only motivation is to say Christ died for you, you're accepted, you're loved, you're justified. For, I want to ask, so what? <laughs> and I, I have a feeling that, that the people who, who, for whom that feels enough the biggest obstacle in their life is, is the absence of that. That's not the biggest obstacle in my life. The biggest obstacle in my life is the fear of tomorrow. Hmm. That's just the way I'm wired. The fear of what's going to happen to me tomorrow. And then, then they would say, oh, well, that's included. You know, that's included. If you're right, justified, right. then you can't. Well, that's, I'm saying, yeah, draw out about 50 of those. Yeah. Draw out about 50 of those. In other words, the, the reason I'm forgiven, accepted, loved is that it has to do with these 40 things and all the blessings that flow to me, especially Jesus and his present fellowship offering, I will help you, I will strengthen you, I'll hold you up with my victorious right hand. I mean, I go into every day counting on promises that he bought. The right. fact that I'm accepted and forgiven and justified is simply the starting place for me. I want to know, yes, I'm accepted, I'm loved, I'm justified, now what? I get Jesus and I get him every day and I get him with all of his strength and all of his help and all of his wisdom and all of his glory that satisfies my soul so that I can move into situations. Is that? Yeah, well, tell me what you think about this. You know, I I hear some people saying and try to understand why they're saying it, but they'll say things like, you know, at the heart, everyone's a legalist, or everyone, you know, the root of all their sin is really an effort at self-justification. So we need justification by free grace to sever that root of the desire to self-justify. And I hear that. It reminds me of, you know, David Pollison talking about some of the, the needs theories in psychology, that everyone is just an empty love bucket, and they just need more love and more acceptance. And I remember him saying, no, my... My bucket's really laziness. I mean, <laughs> I feel loved. I like to be lazy. So just telling me I'm loved is not the only thing that's going to help. And so I wonder if, that, if we're, we're, we're not dealing with all of the scriptural motivations in categories because that's not the only thing that motivates people. And if we preach to people thinking deep down the only, the, the, the bottom, what you need to hear is that God loves you. Well, yeah, we need to hear that. And there's some other things that the Bible tells us, like if you continue down this path, God is going to be very displeased with you. That's also part of the motivation.